something outside. Everything's open for everybody, okay? Everybody good? Yeah, grab this one if you don't mind, because that way I can bounce around. Your sandwich is still coming. So I ordered you a brisket. And fries. So I ordered it right, right where you were getting there. So, Test. Check. Test, Check. test, test, test. Hey, everybody. Everybody. Um, raise your hand if you don't have a tasting mat and glasses. Raise it high. So in the back, we've got Alejandro, we've got Doug. Doug, I'm sorry, you joined the wrong level. You don't get tasting glasses. Alex, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Can't hear you, speak up. I think it's loud in here, but go ahead, try again. Check, 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 test. Can you hear me? 
Steve. Hold on, they're, Alex, they're adjusting the volume. Hold on one sec. Anybody else need a tasty mat or glasses? All right, raise your hand high, and the, the folks passing them out are going to look for you. I can't hear you, Bill. Hello. Hey, Alex. Are you here? Can you hear us? I'm here. Alex. Alex. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You can't what? Can you hear me? There he is. Can you hear Say me? Say something, Alex. Something, Alex. I need more volume from you. I need more volume from you. Yeah, it's just the, your signal to me is low. Give me another test, audio. Alex. Test, test. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? He said something. Okay. One more time. Check, check. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. We're good. I see a lot of thumbs up. Hey guys, how's everybody doing? Is concerned. Up 
by about two feet. Yeah. Mark, that two feet. Oh, actually, no. Yeah, here, I'll grab this thing. I'll grab the back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, guys. It goes from video tape, anyway. I need to stay with you here and the same side on the other side. All right, everybody, take your seat. Graham, Graham and Father, you all come up to the front left. Hey, Connor. We're going to start here in about two minutes. Now, remember, we have a really large group, so if you would, it gets very loud up here. Please be uh, respectful. Dennis, not you. I'm just rubbing your shoulder. That's what Father Springman did in high school to me. It's kind of weird. All right, we ready? Is that you? Y'all ready? Okay, we're starting now. Everybody take your seat. If you would... Give us your attention. We're going to have a fun night tonight. Let me ask a quick question. Raise your hand. Listen up. Raise your hand if you've never had Penelope bourbon. Raise it high. Holy sheep dip. We got an opportunity here, guys. All right. Well, you're going to have fun tonight, and you're going to, I'll bet you, you're going to love what you get ready to try. So welcome to the Big Bourbon Club, our Penelope bourbon presentation and tasting. We're excited to have you here. Um, this has been in the works for a long time. I've been talking to Michael for probably probably a year or more about getting them down here. Last January, the end of January, we sent 15 big bourbon club members to Rizal, New Jersey to their headquarters and operations, and we did a barrel pick, which if you're lucky enough, you got a bottle, but they're totally sold out now. And we had a great time up there. Now, you would have thought working with these guys for a year and a half, buying a barrel from them, getting all the people up there, we could have at least gotten two C-level execs to speak to us tonight, or maybe even two owners. But all we got were a couple of contract employees. You get it? That's a joke. Um, so...
She goes, but you can't go over 400. This is going to be a special deal. And she's going to be the keynote. And um, we're going to have a lot of bourbon. We're going to have a lot of food. And we're going to have a lot of fun. So Mark, October 14th, tickets are not for sale yet. I'll post it when we have all the details up. But Mark, your calendar. So with no further ado, let's, uh, let's turn it over to the reason, the guys, uh, that, for the reason that you're here. Michael Palandini and Danny Pelosi. Come on up, guys. These are the co-founders, CEO and COO, and the owner-founders of Penelope. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, everybody. Whoa, not used to the microphone, so I'll have to get, to get a little used to it. Um, hopefully, my I actually know my jokes are not going to be as funny as yours. So. I know. We got, we got thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the, for the warm reception. Thank you all for, for inviting us down and having us here. This is, um, I don't think I've ever, we've done a lot of events, nothing like this. So this is amazing. Your, your microphone broke up. What did you say? Nothing <laughs> like this. I'm uh, Mike Palladini. I'm the founder of Penelope Bourbon. It's my partner, Danny. I took your thunder. I, took, I stole yeah. your name. Wait. Uh, yeah, Danny Polisi, founder of Penelope. So it's, uh, we've had, uh, as, as Steve had mentioned, we've had uh, a very long 24 hours, an emotional 24 hours. Um, Danny and I started Penelope Bourbon. Um, I actually, uh, we got a very unorthodox story, extremely unorthodox, actually. And, I, you know, we'll tell you a little bit about our background. You'll learn a little bit about ourselves. And then we'll also drink some, hopefully, what you all think is really good whiskey as well, too. So it's kind of the idea for today. And, you know, our, our journey started like we're based in New Jersey. <laughs> like, that's not necessarily a, a, a bourbon powerhouse. Um, but, you know, it kind of started that my, you know, my wife and I were trying to have children for a long time, really long time. Um, you know, we never got the memo after 35. It's hard to have kids. And it took, took many years. But we always said we loved the name Penelope. We just loved it. We loved it. We loved it. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, when we found out we were having a girl, I don't know, maybe like, what, three days later? We were all, my wife and I were thrilled. We were excited. And I just remember coming in three days later. I'm all excited. My wife thought I picked out like a color for the nursery. And I was like, no, 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 no. I got an idea for a business. It's called Penelope Bourbon. And she's like, what? My wife thought I was crazy. She actually still thinks I'm crazy. Um, you are but, crazy. Yeah, we are crazy. But it was, uh, it was one of those things. I mean, I have no experience in spirits. Um, we just, Danny and I absolutely loved whiskey. That's, that was really it. And I think that emotion of just all of a sudden finding out I'm having a girl, and I love that name Penelope, and for, especially from a whiskey perspective, um, you know, because a lot of whiskey is like, you know, a lot of guns, Velcro, dip, all that bullshit. This was a little bit of a softer, softer approach, right? So, so we, you know, I, honestly, it was, it was just pure. We, we started out, I mean, we didn't have any money. We, uh, we just, I turned to Danny, my partner. I said, look, I'm, I'm, you know, he was my next door neighbor growing up. I said, why don't, uh, why don't we go and do this, right? I picked up the phone, I cold call, I actually read an article, I'd never heard of this company called MGP before. Never heard of them. I, seriously, I'm not even kidding you. And this, is, this was back in 2018. And I remember Googling this article and it was um, the largest distillery you've never heard of. And I'll never forget it. I cold called MGP, it was like 1-800-BOURBON or something like that. Cold, I cold called them and I acted like I was in the position to buy like 10,000 barrels. You know, I was trying to get a meeting, you know what I mean? We had, and we didn't, by the way, we didn't have any permits. I didn't even know you needed a permit to buy a barrel of whiskey. <laughs> really didn't. We didn't, no, no attorneys, just, just two chuckleheads calling a large distillery trying to access some barrels. So the, there's a gentleman that uh, kind of fielded our call. He said, why don't you come on down July, you know, it's like July 12th is your birthday. July 12th, yeah, for my birthday. And that's kind of how Danny got started. He goes, you want a plus one for this? And I'm thinking it's kind of like a mini vacation. And so, yeah, let's get a plus one. And Danny, Danny ended up tagging along. Why would I not want to go drink free whiskey? Yes. <laughs> it's crazy. I'll be honest with you. This was, our, this was both of our first time ever going to a whiskey distillery. No bullshit. 
Yeah, it was it was our first time ever, and we, you know, they sent this long email. I actually didn't even read it. I forgot, I didn't realize you had to wear pants in the facility. I showed up in shorts. Fortunately, the guy brought two pairs of jeans. Yeah, partner of the year I right sealed, there. Sealed my deal as the partner that day. Changed in the security room, and we were in. Um, but we we went in there, and it was a deer in headlights situation. I'll, I'll kind of turn it over to you. I'll kind of give a little background when we started doing the initial yeah. blend. I mean, we we walked in the room and. Um, I mean, they had every mash bill they make on the table, years, two years to 11 years at the time. You could buy 11-year-old MGP barrels at the point. At that point. You can't do that now. Um, it's a lot to change in the last five years from that day, but we didn't know any better. Um, we just sat down and, and they said, hey, you know, this is what we have. This is what we have, fellas. You know, mash bills, years, you know, go at it. And they, they sat there for a couple of minutes and then they realized we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Yeah. So they left the room and we're sitting there and we're just, we're kind of just drinking through this whiskey and we're, we're I'm like, Mike, you really want to start this company? The mash bills, and I, we automatically kind of split ways. Uh, Mike liked, liked like the, the rye bourbons they have, like the 21 rye, 36 rye, and was kind of hanging out in that corner of the table. Um, I was hanging out in like the 99 corn mash bill they have, which is like super sweet. It's like, um, it's just, it's, it's beautiful. It's like a movie butter popcorn kind of thing. And then uh, the 45 wheat bourbon they have too, I really like just the, the real creamy, like rich. Um, so we're just kind of like hanging out in our separate corners and MGP comes back in the room and they go, how's it going? We go, uh, yeah, it's going good. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, we didn't really have anything and they go, you know, you know, you could just kind of blend these together, right? And we're like, all right, let's try. Like, why don't you tell us that from the beginning? <laughs> it's like, what? It was, it was, we were deer in headlights situation. Yeah. We like, everything tasted good and we yeah. really liked it, but it was nothing like felt like we could make it our own per se. You know, it's like, it kind of tasted like something else or, you know, it was kind of like one dimensional. Um, so once we started blending these together, we're like, okay, something's happening. And we kind of go back and forth a bunch of times. Mike didn't know how to use the little millimeter pipette thingy. <laughs> when I blend, I use terms like dashes and like, you know, a little dash here, a little dash there. I don't, I'm not, Danny's much like, more specific. All right, let's, let's figure this out. So we, we came up with this blend and I remember the, the exact moment we both looked at each other and we were like, oh wow, that, that tasted good. And what we did was we combined, 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 Combined. Combined. Uh, three different mash bills, that 21 rye, 45 wheat good. bourbon, and um, 99 corn bourbon that they have. And we, at, at the time, we just blended them in equal parts, but we put them together and something was different. And it, at the time, we didn't know it, but we created a, basically a four grain blend um, bourbon. And we looked up and we we're like, this is, you know, we really like this. We didn't know if we liked it because we were drinking too much at the time. Um, <laughs> but we knew something was different. And, uh, and from there, we just, we said, we stopped and we said, this is it. I think this is what we want. And to this day, we still use those three mash bills from MGP and we just blend them together in different ways. And that's something we'll talk about tonight and like how, how we use them different ways to make our different products. So to get, to get everybody starting to sip as we'll kind of go through the story. So the first product you're gonna try, it should be on your left side, is our barrel strength offering. Um, Batch, uh, I believe that we got batch 14. And so what you'll, what you'll notice, this is a blend of those three mash bills, 99 corn, 45 wheat, and 21 rye bourbon. If you, Danny's our master blender, so if you don't like it, it's his fault, <laughs> completely his fault. Uh, we can take feedback. Um, but that, that is, uh, again, it's a batch release. So we, we, we do about two to three of these per year. Um, and this is, uh, that's 14. So it's going to be a very grain forward. You're going to get some of that kind of sweetness from the, the corn and wheat up front with a little bit of the rye spiciness on the back end. Yeah. Uh, the 14, 112, I believe. Yeah, 112. And so, I mean, I, and, and when we had first started, we didn't bring this product here, but our first product ever, um, Steve had told me that this is a high proof crew. So I, 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 I didn't bring our, our four grain 80 proof. I think I would have been like kicked off stage. Um, but, but when we had started, we only had that one product. 
And when in New Jersey, Basil Hayden, you know, all these proofs were getting a little bit higher and higher in proof. And so our, our thought was in New Jersey, Basil Hayden's 50 bucks a bottle. We'll go in 80 proof. It's going to be very sweet with the wheat and corn forward. And we're going to undercut them by $15. And we're going to like maybe try to get like a sliver of market share from them. That was our original idea. That was the big business plan. That, yeah, MGP asked me for a business plan. I was like, what? no. Uh, it's like, but we, we and, and how we, and it, was, it was kind of interesting. So MGP thought we were buying a lot of barrels. And to their disappointment, I wanted to buy one of each mash bill. <laughs> they were a little shocked because they had a really nice spread for us too. They even had some food. Um, and after intense negotiations, they got us up to two per mash bill. They won that one. But so we, we only, and I told them, I said, look, we're going to mess this up. Like, I don't even, I, we didn't even have a glass provider. I didn't even have caps or a, a, we didn't have any, we didn't even have a New Jersey permit where we operated out of. Like we had nothing. It was so, but started with six barrels. Um, and we said, let us just work our way into it. We, we, uh, we decided we could have bought older barrels, but we said, let's start young with two year. Rome wasn't built in the day and let's gradually work our way into older juice. Like, let's just, let's respect the process. Let's learn the trade craft. Let's learn it. And I'll be honest with you, batch one, if you see a bottle of it, do not buy it. A first ever batch. It was rough <laughs> to say the least. Why don't you tell them about batch one? I almost, we almost got out of the business because of it. Well, we learned that day that uh, when you work with a bottling partner, you should probably ask them what they run on the lines before they run your product. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was, this is awesome. So, uh, I mean, I walked into that facility that day and it had like a really pungent smell. Kind of smelled like a... Like margarita. A, yeah, margarita. <laughs> <laughs> I broke out in hives. It was so strong. Yeah, like Danny was like itching himself. Um, so they were running a jalapeno flavored tequila. <laughs> And uh, it, it's stuck in the lines. I called MGPA, so that's why I bought six barrels. We probably, out of that run, we lost the entire first day. It was what, maybe 100 cases? 100 cases. 100 cases. I wrote, that our first run ever, I mean, we grabbed the bottle. I was like, we did it. We're in the bourbon business. I took one sip of it. I almost spit it everywhere. I mean, it was a, it was a really good, but you know what? It was an amazing learning experience because we kind of started to build the methodology we're like all right you know like step one let's find out what they did before right and the, so the, the other thing we learned that day too was you know just because we blended everything in in those parts at mgp that day we these were different barrels that we brought that we bought and ended up at the bottling place and we, we put them together in the same ratios that we did at mgp and it tasted totally different surprise yeah. <laughs> i called up mgp i was like you sold us bad barrels <laughs> and they were like who is this guy? <laughs> Just like you bought six barrels. Stop. <laughs> so that was a that was a really big lesson learned too. Yeah, that was that was interesting. And we could, they they no nah. they told us that they had a sensory panel and that it all checked out normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a it was a, but that's I mean that first batch I mean n not only that but our caps didn't even fit. You needed like a wrench to get our caps off. And I remember, I remember, and we still work with him. He's one of our good friends. Jimmy was like, it's kind of like when you put jeans on after being in the dryer, they're a little snug, but eventually they'll loosen up. They, to this day, if you put the, one of our original caps in, you're not getting it out of the bottle. Like to this day, I go, so, but you, you learn and you, you slowly improve. And, you know, for us, um, this is like a trip down memory lane. It is maybe because it's just what happened, but it's it's been we haven't really told that story too many times. But we, you know, Danny and I found our lanes. <clears throat> we knew we had to continue to we, six barrels, and you know, we sold this from our car in New Jersey, not just those barrels, but for for almost a year. So when we we didn't have a distributor, well, we had jalapeno bourbon. Our distributor didn't want anything to do with it. So. Because of that jalapeno instance, I really do feel like it's karma that we learned like, okay, we, we, we lost 100 cases. I actually still have them at our facility. I wrote jalapeno on all the labels. I was so mad in a big, the, the, the thick Sharpie. Um, we, you know, we took what we had, we got our New Jersey permit, and we went door to door, restaurant to restaurant in New Jersey 
for almost 11 months before we finally got picked up for distribution. Danny and I broke, I mean, if this was a Guinness Book of World Record, I feel like we're pretty close to it. I mean, I think our wives still don't talk to us because of 2019, but we, we probably did 250 in-store tastings each in 2019 in New Jersey alone. I mean, four to seven, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, 12 o'clock tasting on a Sunday, almost the entire year. But it, it, it helped us because we started to learn the business. We started to learn what consumers you know, are saying back to us. We're getting real-time feedback. And our batches were very, very small. So we went from six barrels. And because we didn't have a distributor, we made a little extra money in our bottle. And we took that, like, MGP, and I remember going, yeah, man, I'm gonna need 12 barrels this time. And they were like, all right, you're growing up. So we went from six barrels to 12 barrels to 24 barrels to 48 barrels. So, and, and that's how, and to this day, that's how we run our business. You know, we had no outside investors in our business. And we're not, believe me, we're not multimillionaires. We did not have money like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> we walked right into that one. I didn't mean it like that. But we, 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 we bootstrapped it and we just, you know, we, like I said, we did it very, very piecemeal. And, you know, every run, remember like every run for us was the biggest deal in the world. Because if the run failed, that was, that's, that was it. that's most likely it. Yeah. And, and it was, you know, it was stressful like during the early get go. And th this is one of the most friendly industries I've ever worked in. Yeah. Um, everybody was so helpful, like other brand owners, you know, just kind of like tri trips, uh, tricks of the trade. And that's where we really started like honing in on our blending and we realized how important it is. And, looking into where, where the barrels were coming from, uh, um, started to learn more about where they sat at MGP and what warehouses and things like that. And, I mean, there's so many. I remember uh, I was talking to somebody at MGP and I was asking a ton of questions. You know, why does it do this? Why does it do that? Why is it? And uh, one of the blenders over there goes, Danny, you just, <laughs> you can't ask so many questions. <laughs> you just have to taste each barrel and figure out what it is and then figure out how to use it. And uh, that was something that kind of resonated with me, and I, I took you know to heart, and uh, and just, that's why we really honed in on that blending. And I think, you know, we were a work in progress, and we still are a work in progress. And you know, batch over batch, I'd like to think that we've kind of been improving along the way. Our barrels have been getting a little bit older. Um, you know, we're just kind of making our way through, and uh, and figuring it out really. Yeah. So, hey guys, can we take a pause now for a second? Sure. Yeah. Got a couple of questions. One from Facebook Live. Uh, Mike, to you. If your wife had a son, instead cool. of a daughter, what are we going to name the brand? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Am I supposed to know this answer? I don't. I don't know. I don't. I. I, I don't think I'd have a brand. Mike would have been Mike. It would have been uh, Mike's bourbon. No. Uh. Okay. So let's do this. It's a bad I, answer. I'm sorry. That was my question. I made that up. <laughs> Hey, how you doing, guys? Uh, that, that's such a great story. I love the fact that you you did bootstrap instead of these two humble guys with these multi-million dollar uh, companies and just decided to get a hobby. Uh, my question to you, though, is is uh, you know what what's in the future for for your brand now that you are under under a much bigger tent? I've I've loved everything that I've been able to get my hands on from your uh, from what you you've put out from the barrel picks to you know your your your, your Cooper series. Your different finishing series and it's just been great but what's what's going to be the the impact to, uh, on this end um after the after your sale yeah that's a great great question i so for us um we have been looking at our like a, as we started to grow the the days of buying 24 barrels for the run that's coming up start especially after the big surge in bourbon it's it's barrel barrels are expensive um and they were hard to even buy out. And I think the reality started to set in when we were, you know, we're trying to continue to grow. And you you look at uh, your your inventory and even like, I, I didn't even know what I was doing next next Saturday, let alone like three years from now and trying to project out. And, you know, for us, um, look, it's got my daughter's name on the label. Like I'm in it, whether we have, we're owned by, whether we're owned by someone else, 
like we, we're, we're very emotionally attached to this. And so with, with MGP, it was just such a great fit because A, we get all of our bourbon from them, all of our whiskey. Um, but they're, they're a smaller, they're not, I mean, they're a big company, don't get me wrong, but they're not like a Diageo. They're not, they're not a massive organization um, in terms of some of the other large suppliers. And I think what was, was telling is the fact that they wanted Danny and I to be heavily involved along with our team and to continue making great products with great whiskey that they have available. And so we felt like it was just a really good fit um, to, to continue growing and to continue to innovate. And I, I, you know, the plans for us right now are, you know, let's let the dust settle, but you know, how do we expand into, like we're not in California, we're not in Florida and, and, and more out on the West Coast. So I think that was kind of the idea for us. I think partnering with them, like Mike said, we've, we've been with them since day one. You know, we've treated them as a partner from day one. We've always listed them on our website. You know, we've always just been very open that this is a, an MGP distilled product and, you know, we're, we're doing, doing things with it. Um, I, I'm excited because, you know, like we're going to be able to focus on product and keep focus on the growth of the brand. Um, you know, we, we were growing really quick and, uh, you know, just the, the troubles of being a small business, you know, but, and like operating it on a day to day was getting, was getting hard. And, uh, you know, now it's, we have, we have a lot of whiskey. <laughs> um, we can do what we love. We can make product the way we, we want to, we can, we could just keep going and we can, we can take our initial dream to the next level. And, and to put it in perspective, this is funny. Danny's our master blender and he's good too. He's really good. Thanks. Master blender, chief operating officer, CHRO. He runs payroll. Uh, what else? Uh, he did our insurance. What HR. else? HR. Oh, I unloaded a truck at 2 a.m. last night. Unloaded week. a truck. <laughs> I mean, so we do, yeah. We, and we I do other stuff. If you're wondering what I do, I do a lot of, I well, do big you, stuff. You do, you do a lot. <laughs> We've, uh, yeah. yeah, so we we're all wearing a lot of hats. Now. Yes. Hopefully we have, we have a lot of help to just keep going. That's, that's the idea. Hopefully that helps answer it. Amazing. Thanks so much. Go ahead. I was just saying, thanks so much. Thanks. That's, that's oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> thanks Paul. Okay. Real quick. Um, we've poured the first three expressions. This is all you get. I'm sorry. So if you drink it too fast, you're out. So we'll start tasting now. We'll start tasting. Go first only. Wait for the second. Do your prompted. Third, do your prompted, or you'll miss out on the sequence that uh, Mike and Danny wanted us to have. So why don't we start yeah. with the first? Take a sip of it, and then I'll turn it back over to you, Mike. Yeah. No, they got the first one. Yeah. Did you already drink it? Barrel strengths. Well, let's go to. Yeah. Architect. Let's go to number two. Architect. You want to give him the skinny on architect? <laughs> yeah. Well, Ar architect, we what did we release it last year? Uh, last April. Last April. Um, architect spawned out of um, it was after our toasted product. I don't know if you've had our toasted product. It, you, you will taste it. Um, but toasted, we we do our we do a blend of our of our mash bills. And we put it into a secondary finishing barrel, uh, usually a space side barrel or a Kelvin barrel. And we leave it in there for a period of time. To, and, you know, we taste it along the way and we figure out when the right time to pull it is. But uh, we were doing toasted at different char levels, different toast levels. And if you notice, if you go to the store, sometimes you don't see the same char and toast level. So we kind of change it up a lot. We do it for a couple of reasons. One reason is because we didn't know the difference between char and toast. Um, and then two, because each barrel uh, is different. Every time you put, you can put the same blend into the into two barrels that are the same char and toast level, and they'll come out different. And I realized why because we went to the cooperage uh, last year, and I saw how they toast these barrels. They like make a little fire on the warehouse floor, and they put the barrel on top, and they just say, "All right, that's about sixty seconds." So I I, I now know why it's so different. So we were talking with the Cooperage and we were asking these questions and they, they said, we have a product that's used mostly in the wine industry and it's these, it's these French oak staves. And the staves, one, one thing about the staves is that when they cut the trees and they make the lumber and they're, they're picking the wood for the staves, they evaluate the wood chemically and they can, they can pull wood that has the same 
similar chemical profiles so that they know that, you know, the finishing profile will be similar. So it's not just guessing it, you know, you might have a, a piece of wood from the core of a tree, from the outside of the tree, and it's different. It has different effect on the whiskey. You could be in a different forest and it has a different effect on the whiskey. So that's step one with the, with the staves. They know exactly the profile that it's going to give off. And then two, they're thin kind of, you know, quarter inch thick and one inch wide and they go through an oven like a precisely heated oven and it gets toasted very equally instead of somebody just kind of building a campfire and throwing a barrel on top of it. So that was interesting to us. So we asked for some samples and we started playing around with it and we were able to make these small little sample blends at like a lab kind of desk style and then cut off you know, just a, the right amount of wood, put it in the, in the whiskey and see what the effect of it was. So we were able to do that. And then we were able to take that sample and recreate it at a much larger scale, you know, make a batch of 2000 cases, but we tested it and, and perfected it at a lab kind of scale. And that was great because the toasted is just kind of like, it's, you're always kind of adjusting and, and, you know, hoping it turns out good. And then you have to like, backtrack or go forward but this you, you create it and it's just very specific and you can you can recreate it over and over again which is nice i don't know where matt is matt's over there matt raise your hand so we and we came up with the name we were on a phone call matt danny and i usually when most of our products our names it's like usually 2 30 in the morning we were on a call going through some names like what would you have like the draftsman or you had some and, and I was an engineer, so I don't know why we didn't call it that. Yeah. Well, Matt's father, then Matt, Matt, Matt drops architect. And he's like, you know, my old man's an architect. I go, that, let, that's perfect. Let's go. And then I, we tried it, and, and we, we moved extremely quick. And I think it's like a six-week finish period about, about that. So that was the start of the architect. So this is bad. Uh, we call it build. A little cheeky. But it's uh, build six of the architect. So we even though we, we can precisely kind of blend it at a small scale, we've been tweaking the batches as we create it. We call them builds. Um, and we're just really just playing around with um, some barrel types or, or I'm also playing around with kind of how much we're staving the, the whiskey itself. Um, I feel like as we develop this product, um, build one was like a very light staved product. It was, so it's a, little, it's a light French oak. And then I was like, well, we like that, you know, let, let's try a little, let's try a little more. So I feel like every build, we've just been kind of going heavier and heavier on the, on the French oak yeah. uh, as we like, we really start liking it. No, none of these are chill filter. So since the mat are so light, would you use in this one, the architect, the same three mash build Build you had before, you're now getting a fourth mash bill or a fifth mash bill. You know what I'm saying? Build one and two. Build one and two, we used a four grain blend of three mash bills. And then we were playing around, playing around, and we liked what the 21 rye mash bill did alone with a specific stave that we they called it the complex stave. It's it's essentially a, a medium plus toast on a stave. And we've been working with that from build three through six, actually build four through six. So the company that's now, are you still going to get your mash bill from Aaron, whatever, MGB, or, is it, or are you getting new mash bills from the people who bought you, or are you going to switch it to the same facility, so it's the same whiskey. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that was why it was, for us, it was, we're already buying the whiskey, and they, they have, They've got a lot of whiskey, and it was that to us. We didn't have to. Our, us, our product should only get a lot better. Yeah. No, and that's the thing. Like, I mean, on Friday we got good word on Friday that there was approval on this deal. I, I think I was. We were on the phone with the sourcing guy, like. All right, can we like like what can we get? We were like kids at a candy yeah, store get, a little get, bit. Give us the keys to the Rick House. Yeah, <laughs> but that's a good question. One oh four. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, mechanical. I, I was an engineer, like construction type stuff, mechanical. 
And I, I worked in technology, so like enterprise software. It's kind of a fun job. We just travel around yeah. the country with our best friend and drink whiskey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our wives are thrilled. <laughs> well, what's funny, what's funny, so it was founded, I mean, founded by um, Penelope. So Penelope's uh, about four and a half now, right? So, I mean, her whole life has been this business. And when we had first started it, literally there was no children. Fast forward basically five years and between both of our families, there's five. It's bonkers. <laughs> so, in the industry, is there already sort of prepackaged software to measure and monitor all the stuff? Or do you now just say, well, I was in the software side, I'm going to now also be building software as my, build, as my business grows? Yeah, well, on, the, on the, the barrel and the product side, I think there's more sophisticated software that's being developed. On, I think on the sales and marketing side, it's like I'm in 1983. So it's very antiquated, um, the software side. I'm the, more the sales and marketing and distribution side. Um, but I think the product side is a little bit more, has gotten a little bit better. No, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Question. Raise your hand if you have a question. Hey, well, when they first started, it was 200,000, 200,000. Five, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it was, it was, I mean, think about it. I had my six barrels. I mean, I could do it right now. There was no, there was no business plan. You had to bottle it and stuff like that. Yeah. Big one, six barrels. I had a lot of content. Yeah. You come in, I come in, and then the next thing come in, and then we kind of like, kind of, we did it like, that and then we finally had product and then sold it and you kind of got the engine going. How long did it take to put together an operating program? We did it on legal zoom, it took like 10 minutes. <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. When, when though? After the day you started Love Legal Zoom. It's a plug for them. It's great. How long did it take before you signed up for a subscription legal zoom to do an operation? We didn't have an attorney for a while, and which is actually was a little problematic. <laughs> I would recommend maybe an attorney might be a good investment early on. Just here's a funny story. So even in New Jersey, like New Jersey is crazy. Um, like we got our liquor license in Nebraska in like three minutes. Like I, I don't even think they look like it was just like done. In New Jersey to this day, we still operate on temporary permit to operate. And they know us. And are, it's, are there any distillery whiskey attorneys in the audience? Raise your hand. <laughs> Hire an attorney. Right it, you need them, right <laughs> or else you're going to be on a temp permit. <laughs> but one of the things fun too was, I mean, this was uh, very uh, crazy for us. Even when COVID happened, um, we believed in in-store tastings. We didn't. Doesn't matter how nice your bottle is or how cool your packaging is. It's hard. Bottles do not sell themselves off the shelf. Period. The end. And and we learned that by doing all these tastings in 2019. And we wanted people to try the product because we felt if they tried it, I think there's a high probability they may like it. Or then the, and then they're gonna maybe tell someone else about it. So and that that was our that was our model. And what when uh, COVID had hit, all those tastings got shut down. And I, I was very nervous. I mean, I, I remember that I was like, that's our whole our entire marketing strategy was in store tastings. I remember I was like, oh, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Glass half. <laughs> empty man um so but but i remember that when it when it happened and i we operate uh we now we have a little bit of a larger facility that we lease now we just got it like a couple months ago in new jersey about 10 minutes away finished goods but for basically up till about four months ago our facility is 2600 square feet it's amazing what you could do with 2600 square feet we have the most cost effect i don't care who I'll take any distillery on. We have the most cost-effective bottling line in the entire industry, and it's clean, it works, and it pumps out some great product. And like a fun, here's a fun fact about the bottling line is that we, the, we were leasing it, um, our, our facility that we have, we still are, um, but when COVID hit, I go, Danny, we gotta get a DSP. We have to get one because we, we felt that with the, like we can contract bottle out, like we contract bottle out with um, Bardstown Bourbon Company, so we felt like we can do our larger volume products with them and they're a great partner of ours.
But when it comes to innovation like architect, and I think we always felt more comfortable doing them, you got to do R&D. There's going to, you're going to have some hiccups. You're going to have things that go wrong. And we, when COVID hit, we turned around to DSP on our facility within 60 days, no attorney, sorry. And that was, that was hard. I mean, that was, should have, that, that, but it's that was expensive. And, and so, but Danny, uh, Danny and our, our Jace, who's been with us since day one, um, he, they, they basically built the bottling line from scratch and it's the one we use today for all of our, for all of our projects. So you folks have been up there. We actually did, who, who came up uh, in January? You came up, right? That's all, we've redone it a lot. We put new flooring down and things like that. So we're always making little small upgrades to it, but. So Mike, this question that I had on uh, Facebook earlier. Yeah. Now that you're under the umbrella, in terms of operations, in terms of the day-to-day, -day, how long do you stay in Rizal? How long do you stay the way you've been doing it forever? Short term, or do you know? I mean, that was a big thing for us. Roselle has been, um, uh, it's, it allows us to be very agile, right? So Roselle is, um, you know, for our, for our sales team, like doing private barrels. Uh, it's just a way for us to quickly maneuver and get things out. I, uh, you were asking me a question about um, how fast we could turn barrels out. Like, if you really needed it, I mean, there's times where it'll be like, pe people have picked it, and I'm like, dude, we need this bottled, like, in three days. I mean, that, and, you know, there's timing to get it picked up and things like that. But that, that's agility. That's a, to us, that's always been a competitive advantage over some of the bigger folks that takes a little bit longer. So it's that, that's a vital piece to our business. And if you don't know, Roselle is 15 minutes from Zurich Airport. It is simple to get to. I'd recommend the holiday. Where do we stay, Alejandro? No, we say the courtyard. Yeah. And literally, though, it's 15, 20 minutes maybe yeah. from uh, Newark to the city. It's very easy. Having, that, having our own DSP was was um, incredibly important because we learned, especially when we we're doing these cast finishes or we were doing these small small batch blends that you need to be like touching and taking samples out of barrels and, and kind of like really hands on with them. And uh, so it was game changing to how we operated and like what we were able to innovate and come out with. And, and actually kind of just moving on too. I mean, that Toasted series was the first product we did out of our facility in Roselle when we got the DSP. And so that's the, the third one is a, uh, it's a toasted bourbon. And the architect's not toasted? It's toasted, it's like French choke staves though. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. What's the proof on this? That should be 100 proof, that batch. One oh four. Yeah. All right. Has everybody tasted the architect? <laughs> Raise your hand if you haven't tasted it. All right, let's do this. Let's do this. Straw poke. Who liked the barrel strength? The first tasting the best of the two. Okay. Who liked architect the best of the two? So it's about a fifty fifty group. And that that's kinda interesting because that's that's really how it sells too. Um I think we feel like that's kind of how we deplete uh, our inventory very equally in those two categories. And what was the proof of the barrel strength again? Uh, uh, 112. 112. 112 of the barrel proof, right? What did you get on the architect? What notes did you get? What did you get when you nosed it? Cinnamon, vanilla. Cinnamon, vanilla. What else? Anything else? Speak up. I thought it was a lot spicier than the barrel fruit. Stacy, you thought it was spicier than the barrel fruit? Yeah. Anybody else? Marshmallow. Marshmallow. I always disagree and say yes to everything. <laughs> I get marshmallow all the time. <laughs> no, no, no. I know what you mean, though. I, I, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Customer taste preferences evolve as either the bourbon industry matures or their customer base gets larger. What are you seeing in the customer demand? Great question. I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, uh, there, I, I, we don't have sophisticated tech like data. Like so, this is like gut punch. 
I, this is more of the masses thinking across this, is very, you know, pallets are what I think pallets are very regionalized. Um, I, I, I've seen in the, in the early adopters, obviously cast finishes, pallets want new and unique cast finishes is a lot of what I've seen recently. But the one big one that I, him and I go back and forth on, I actually think there's a, a drawback on barrel strength. I think people, this is mess. I think people had a huge blitz of cast strength, 110 to 120. And I'll be honest with you, even myself personally, I'm like, all right, maybe like I'm, I, I kind of like seeing it toned back to like 104, 105. I, that is something that we've seen pretty, like, again, there's no data, it's just a hunch, but that's a lot of the feedback. A lot of our comes just from our palates. Like we don't, you know, we kind of just like, does it taste good? And we're like, yeah, I like it, it tastes great. And that, that's important for us. Hey, what's that? Uh, my wife is watching. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Danny, you're on your own. I can't. Oh, Danny, uh, Candace Felipe has a question. Yeah. <laughs> great. I love you. <laughs> I told you I was in Kentucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that that's where that's where my palate went when we first started. Like I, I really liked a lot of that sweet stuff out there. Um, like mellow corn was a, one of my favorites. You know, like so I was always a high corn kind of person. Mike dabbled in rye more than I did. And I think when we started combining the two is kind of like we had very different palettes and the fact that if we can come up with something that we both like, then maybe a lot more people will like it. And I think that has been something that kind of played into our brand and has been a reason why we've kind of cast a larger net. Um, most of all of our products are in like this 70 to 80% corn in the mash bill, like the final blends kind of end up in that range. So they are all very high corn. And then some of our blends, um, become, you know, even though you're in 70 to 80% corn, it'll either be a higher rye blend or a higher wheat blend. And we'll use that factor into what product to put it into. Um, what's a good example? Like uh, our rosé cast finish. We, those blends are usually more of a higher wheat or blend. You know, they, they want to be more creamy. They want to they wanna have that, that sweetness, that, um, that, that, that wheat because it interacts with the wine a lot better. So let me, uh, let me take a break for a second. We've had two, we're gonna go to three and four. Quick question. Has anybody ever heard of Penelope Rio? Yeah! Raise your hand. Well, this is why I'm here. Give that girl two tickets. <laughs> Andrea, Edson, welcome. You gotta come see me afterwards. We'll start playing oh, I, I'm glad to. All right. Alright, don't pull a hamstring, stay seated for now. <laughs> Does anybody else know about Rio? Okay, so before, okay, I'm going to have a gentleman tell you about it, but you're getting a red raffle ticket, and we're going to draw for this bottle at the end of the night. Okay. And if you're not a member, you don't win unless you pay the immediately. <laughs> well, we'll see. Okay, tell them about Rio before we go to three. Yeah. This, uh, and I think it should be hitting coming out very soon. It was uh, a part of our Cooper series. So Cooper is Danny's for now four-year-old son. Uh, Four-year on Saturday. Four-year on Saturday. So Cooper, got to keep it in the family. Um, yeah, go Cooper. We, uh, so we, that's all of our cast finishes in the Cooper series. So that's our fourth kind of call it installment. And we had started, we, uh, what, two years ago, honey was real popular. I've seen, you know, everyone had to have a honey finish, right? I was like, I want to do a honey finish. That'd be kind of cool. And I'm thinking I'll put a bumblebee on label and put it in yellow and that's cool. So we had contacted uh, uh, like a cider mill in New Jersey um, and, and a bee farm and kind of extracted and got, all, got the honey we needed. And so we put honey into, you know, I think it was our 21 rye bourbon barrels, freshly dumped. And it stayed at this cider farm. It was, it was, the honey was probably in these barrels. Like, we forgot about it. Like, I didn't even, I was like, what's going on with that honey project? And he's like, that's a I good question. Well, I kept, I kept <laughs> deflecting because I didn't want to deal with the honey. He didn't want to deal with the honey, but I was like, I was yeah. like, oh, don't bring them back in this place. It's going to be all messy. And 
Yeah, and you get uh, ants Can and stuff. we just stuff. focus on bourbon for a second? <laughs> yeah, like I, every, every like a couple of weeks, I'd be like, dude, what's going on with that honey? Have you ever talked to those? Did they take it? I, only honey in the yeah. barrel. So the, they were going to use the honey. They were, they were going to put it in our bourbon barrel, let it sit, get, the, get that bourbon in the honey, take the honey out. Then they were going to put it into their cider yeah. and jar it and all that stuff. You did forget about it, though. I did. <laughs> <laughs> did everybody get a chicken? Oh no! Yeah, we did three. Good, ah. we, ripped we ripped the toast. We already did it. I have you started. <laughs> Get in there. Well, I want to talk to you all for a second. Yeah. Okay, let's pour number four. Let's, let's proceed way off. Okay. Number four. Number four. The big bourbon barrel pick. I'll tell you a story. Uh, we, we chose a heavy toasted barrel. So, um, the big, raise your hand if you got a big bourbon club bottle. Okay. So, what we chose as a club is the heavy toasted bottle. And I think it's, you can look at the bottle, I think it's 112 point something cast proof, but it's a great bottle. But we had 12 people in Roselle up in the tasting room, 12 members of the big bourbon club from the Northeast came in. Uh, we had members from Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, D.C., Kentucky, Florida, and we had a couple fly in, Chicago. Uh, we had a great time. They were incredible hosts and hostesses. And we chose from four different, uh, three toasted and one architect. We narrowed it. To, I think there were five. But, yeah, there were five original. We narrowed it down. We threw out the first one that we liked the least. We then threw out two, and we were down to the finalist. And then when we tasted the finalist, for, we're now in our fourth or fifth sip now. Eleven of the 12 of us picked the same bottle that we chose as our pick. And I'm not going to mention Bob Wright. I'm not going to mention anybody's name who didn't choose Bob Wright out of Melrose, Mass. He's watching right now. We chose a hell of a bottle, and it's completely sold out. It was fantastic. So, gentlemen, thanks for giving us the opportunity because everybody doesn't get a barrel pick. It's hard to do. It takes a long time if you're lucky enough to get one. So we're very blessed that we got one. So thank you for that. Let's do this. Let me, now, uh, before we go to our second taste, let me mention some sponsors here. Well, excuse me, the fourth taste. Uh, Mitchell Tours and Sean Higgins. Most of you know Sean, big sponsor of the Big Bourbon Club. Buster's Liquor Store in Memphis, Tennessee. Josh Hammond, great friend and a great sponsor of the club. Revival Liquor Store in Covington, Kentucky. Revival Spirits. Shannon Smith, Shannon, stand up. Shannon founded Revival Spirits. It's a... Uh, don't sit down yet. Shannon also, well, not only is she the founder of Revival Spirits, it's a dusty store. They get old bottles. Some of them are pre-prohibition. When I say old, really old. Some of them are 60s, 70s, 80s. But you can buy for the glass for like 10 or 15 bucks at the bar. You can buy bottles. And there's nothing like it in the state of Kentucky or anywhere for I know of. So get up to Covington and go see Shannon and Brad. But also Shannon uh, owns the law office, Smith Law Offices. The offices of Shannon Smith, I think, is what it officially is. Sorry about that. But Shannon is a, Shannon's a local kid out of Hardin County, uh, University of Louisville, and she started a law firm specializing in the distillery business, and she's a great friend and a great partner. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> Element 502, we've got Bill Reynolds. Thank you, Bill, as always. Under production, Charles Renee. Sets this whole thing up, puts it together. Charles, thank you. We call him Chuck. No, we don't. Charles, thank you very much. Uh, Sherry Radler, Sherry, I don't think is here. Our accounting group um, and Smash Graphics. Scott sent, uh, Scott's over there. The best graphic art designer agency on planet Earth. Right? Yep, you're the greatest. Don't ever change. Okay. Any questions before we go to the final tasting and then we'll do the drawing?
Any in-person questions? All right, gentlemen. And, uh, and the, the, the toasted that you're drinking today is the toasted pick, actually. I think I said it was 100 proof. It's actually 116.2. So. Just a little different. <laughs> <laughs> we. So we got the last one, Tokai. I, I mean, I think it went out, Matt. Matt, when is Rio? It should be oh, this this week. I mean, it should be this week or next week for Rio. sure. Yeah. yeah, week and a half. This this is uh, the first one. Uh, just to put it in context, so this is a uh, we had our honey going for about a year and a half, and at the same time we had Umbriana barrels. Uh, that's which is Brazilian oak, and so it's a double cast finish between honey and Umbriana, and they, they, they kind of balance each other out really nicely. Uh, this was a very small release. It's the first one, um, you know, of LTO, but we, I, 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 when I want more product, I just turn to Danny. I'm like, we got to quadruple that for February. Well, yeah. I go, he'll figure it out. This was hard <laughs> to make. This, is, this one was a labor of love. Okay. Um, since it was the first one, we didn't really know, again, what we were doing. So we did a honey finish, and it was just like, it was a lot of honey. So what we did was we refinished it and we kind of layered on top of the first batch, 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 batch to try to hone in on that honey finish. And once we got the honey finish right, then we put in Umbriana cast and did a light finish to Umbriana to give it that that kind of gingerbread nose, you know, bourbon on the palate and then a little bit of like honey on the back end. So ballpark, how long did you age for in the honey cast? So. Th this version of Rio was made up of like five different, five to seven different batches. So it varied. Some of the batches were two week finish of honey. Some of them were three months finish of honey. And it was just kind of that blending over blending over blending that kind of honed in on where it needed to be at. If we do the, on our next batch, we'll be able to get to, to the end goal a lot quicker. It was about, this was about 650 cases. Yeah. So 3,600 3, bottles. bottles. Okay. Hey, guys, everybody, hold up. Edson, one sec. I'm going to go over here. We have a question in the corner. Edson and Andre, to you next. Where's the design? Well, I figured the like, Brazilian oak, and it kind of tasted like a party in a bottle, and I think it was right around, you know, like. I think it's like this brand. Oh, the brand or the, the Rio, this, this one? Oh, yeah. Well, well, in the beginning, if you saw our, uh, some of our first bottles, we didn't have like a, a creative agency. Danny and I basically did the label in crayons. Um, and uh, we, by, you know, just at the time, I mean, it was right around this time. Pe it's peonies are in full bloom right around now. And that's a peony. It's, you know, my wife's favorite flower. So I just we had originally we didn't have the peonies. And I just wanted a big I go, just make it a big pea. You put it on a bar. It's going to be recognizable. That was literally the strategy. And we, we did that, and then uh, at the, it looked a little bare, and so we put a peony on it. Right. Right. Okay. Well, you did that because you said the big P. Did anybody notice that? Nice catch. <laughs> All right, so Edson. This was 98. 98. Hey guys, everybody quiet please. We have a question. Thank you. Mike's Mike's on. On. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah, I mean, I mean, Mike, 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 Mike,
with with everybody on a day to day. I mean, um, I still think it's amazing. Like he knows he, he's on a first name basis with you know liquor store owners in all these different states. Um, we we have a whole. I mean, we've I got like a, more friends in Louisville than I do in my hometown. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not even kidding you. But we've also been traveling around, and we just we've become friends with so many people over the last five yeah. years, and it's uh, you know we're just like hanging out. <laughs> hey, hey, just wait after the news, somebody freaks again. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, I've always just early on. I mean, I I shared a lot of stuff on social media, and uh, brands never commented or said thank you for the support or just you know just a little some, some you know something right and we just wanted to be super engaged partly because we like enjoy doing it it's fun and it doesn't feel like it's work it's just part of part, like part of what what makes us work like it's just it's fun and and we still are we're still amazed that people drink the whiskey that we put in bottles so it's <laughs> yeah Hey guys, can you hear me? Mark's down in uh, the rich side of Naples, Florida. What's up, Mark? Hey guys, I almost flew up last minute, so I wanted to come to the event. Um, so, being first generation Hungarian, I'm very familiar with Tokai. So, I just want to know what really was your inspiration because I've done my own finish. So, I had a bottle of 1989 Tokai that I made for my son for, I did awesome. a, a barrel and put it into a. Uh, um, bourbon and with poured a little bit of in there. I just want to know what was your uh, your impetus behind it because obviously, being the oldest wine region in the world, it's a very sweet wine. And just wanted to understand how you guys have, you know, what was your impetus and and genesis in making this bottle. I mean, I, I for us, uh, you know, we we have a partner in Space Side, and. We always want to try to just do something that's a little different and a little unique and kind of try to push the envelope a little bit. Like with our first, our first cast finish was a rosé cast finish, which is pretty uncommon. And I, I think we wanted to always kind of continue down that path of this is a platform where we could just innovate and try to come up with new flavors and ideas. And, to, and, and I think Tokai, um, it all really stemmed about, we, we were able, we were, got those barrel, we had some really good rye barrels in the initial batch that we got from Whistlepig. Yeah. And that's what started. And I said, these are a special batch of rye. This is the first batch from last year. And I remember talking to Space Side and we go, we really want something that's different. And uh, we really want something that we're, it's going to be really hard to pronounce that no one's, no one's going to know how to pronounce. Is it? And by the way, I got to ask you, I probably, I, I think I did mispronounce it for the first six months. Until someone told me, they're like, oh, it's Tokai. I thought you were just trying to be cool. No. <laughs> yeah, Hungarian, now, but... Hungarian's a tough language. Yeah. But I, that, that was really the, the, the basis of it was just continue to, to push the envelope. But anytime we do that, uh, Space Side always mandates, like we had to go out. Usually how we even start a cast finish is we'll go to the liquor store. He's going to go be like, go buy these types of Tokai wines, right? You go and buy them and then... You pour, I usually pour our barrel strength is a good barometer. And I put a, a couple, you know, maybe 1% or 2% of the wine directly in the barrel strength just to get an idea if it's in the ballpark. Right. That's, yeah, that's, that's one of the best ways to do it. If it. Then if it's in the ballpark, we'll, we'll order a few barrels and take it to R&D. Yeah, because it seemed like the scotch industry did it first. And I've seen it mostly with uh, rise. I've seen one with bourbon. I've done the whistle pig, took I, um, as well. So... My last question really goes to Steve. When are we doing a pick uh, for the uh, Tokai? Oh. Well, my answer, my answer goes to Mike and Danny. So when are we doing that pick? Danny is actually filling Tokai barrels this week. Oh, well, maybe next week. Yeah, We have, I'll, we I'll, have Tokai I'll come barrels. to that one. He's filling. So I'll yeah. say it about two months is what I'm guessing, but they didn't say it. Probably in the there. summer. I think we'll have a, a batch. In the summer. Going. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Cheers. Nice. Tokai. Yeah, the, the Tokai was oh, yeah, yeah, was kind of interesting because, yeah. uh, like Mike said, the, we 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 liked the we liked the feel of the Tokai, the wine. It was good. We knew it kind of mixed with the bourbon well, and when we brought it in, we just kind of played with different 
different whiskeys. And this release actually turned out to be our first rye release. And so it's, it's different. It's a little bit different than the other ones. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I remember it when I, I remember it. I quit when we got when we got picked up for full distribution in New Jersey. So when we were selling it from our car, I mean, it's it a big decision, right? We had a young, Penelope's young. But when we got picked up for distribution in New Jersey, it's, you got to show them that you're in it. Like your distributors are, they will not, if you're not like, oh, I can't go to the meeting. I got a, a conference call. They're like, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna keep pushing your brand. And that's probably late 2019. So probably around December, 2019. September, right? Yeah, right around there, yeah. I don't know if I'm allowed. <laughs> I might be too. Sorry. I have no idea if I want to say that. It was a mutual love for each other. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So that's the Tokai that you're drinking right now, and and these glasses are for you all to to take home as well too. Salud. MGP, uh, obviously they have a lot of distillate, they have a lot of GNS, they have a lot of alcohol. Um, and they had uh, merged with uh, Luxco out of St. Louis and Luxco is a big, they, they, they pump brands and that's a big, they have a big sales and distribution engine with, uh, with what they're doing out of there. And so my, you know, my guess is that's, a, that's an interesting piece for them where a lot of the, you know, a lot of these big houses don't necessarily have all that distillate. But they do, and so you know, bringing in brands isn't necessarily a bad idea. So Luxco, if I'm right, I think I don't really know 100, percent but that would be my but guess. I think Luxco was their first acquisition of brands, less perhaps than years ago, right? Yeah. I mean, there may have been another one or two. Yeah, maybe. They're just getting into what I call retail. Yeah, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that that yeah. I and I really don't know, but that that seems like the etymology. That seems like where I think it's going for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, our model with pricing has always been very simple. We, um, you know, we, we don't, we, we didn't, we took a fresh look. We didn't have background in it. So like, I mean, we, you know, for us, I wanted a product that was always available, always on the shelf and a good price, right? From the beginning, that's always been our model, readily available at a good price. And that, that's always been the, the mantra for us. I've been wanting to get rid of that thing for a while. He loves it. We, our rosé cast finish, it has a, I don't know if you ever had a rosé wine that has a glass topper on it. So we used a glass topper on our rosé cast finish bourbon. So nobody some, can get it off. Nobody can get it off. Well, and it's just, actually easy. All you got to do is pop it you with your thumb. It it's actually your, not hard. Your finger and it comes off. And it's, it's so funny when you see everyone, they're always like, God, this stupid thing. They're trying to twist it off and it's, it's like locked. <laughs> that was, was your idea. idea. <laughs> and he's like, just go with it. Can, you can have the glass topper. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah. First of all, tell me. 41? 40. You always look at markets. 30, yeah, 30 states. But 34 yeah, markets. 34, 34 markets, 30 states. 
mostly on the East Coast and up and down the Eastern Seaboard. Oh, thank you. We've been busy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I don't know. That's. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's usually the out. It just pops up. I'm on there at night, and I'm like, "This is great." And I, usually, I just send the DM and be like, "I'd love to send you a bottle." Like that's usually how it is, I right? I think that's how it went down. Stop. Let me say something. No, that's all right. <laughs> I got this. No, but, but for real, at the very beginning of the TikTok, which is really seriously. Is it? Okay. okay. So, so, sorry about that. At the very beginning of TikTok, when I went viral on TikTok, I got a bottle from Bourbon and 30 in Georgetown. Do you know those guys? And they put it in a plastic cup thing with a little top. I'm like, yes, I made it. And it was actually pretty good. And then it took six weeks to get to the second bottle. But you all were one of the first five bottles that you said that you had every time you do. And it was really, really, really good, and it was very genuine. When I reviewed it, I really, really, really liked it, and it just as he did too, because we liked the good right? But anyway, <laughs> son, you work for me. I'm going to your probationary period. He's got extended six months. I'm all about to bring it Anyway, let me just say this. And you all were growing in early in your stage and kind of COVID as I was too. Thanks for finding me and thanks for giving me a chance because I really appreciate it. And you guys have been incredible. So anyway, we're not done yet. I don't know if there's any other questions for asking to answer them. I think we gotta do a raffle, right? Hey, hey guys, how's everybody doing? Introduce yourself, Alex and Margarita. Tell us where you're from. I'll let Margarita go first. Okay, I'm not sure I'm on. Am I on? Yeah. Oh, okay, so I'm Margarita. I'm from Abilene, Texas. And I just want to say I appreciate your story, first of all. Um, I just... Um, I just, I just appreciate where you, how far you come, the skills you have to make what you have today. Um, my question is basically at this point, I think I'm freezing. I hope I'm not freezing on there, but anyway, my question is what's your favorite product? What's that go-to product as far as what you've made that you go, this is, this is what I love the most. Oh, uh, right. My, my palette changes, but right now I'm very, very big on architect. I've been drinking a lot. That's my. That's like my current go, like go to number one right now. I'm back to barrel strength. Yeah. Yeah. But we love them all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Margarita, what's your what's your favorite Penelope? 
Um, right now, I love the cast strength. Um, that's what I'm loving the most. They're all very good. Um, but I do love the cast strength. And then, of course, the big pick. I really do like that one. I, I prefer this. Well, I guess I love this one. I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So let, me, let me brag on Margarita out of Abilene, Texas. Number one, she has the biggest bourbon bar in Abilene, Texas. Awesome. And number two, she was in Louisville last week, and she got uh, she passed her executive bourbon stewardship class. So congratulations. All right. All right, Alex. All right, my name is Alex Cowling. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, the rich side, as Steve likes to say. Uh, no, I don't but the rich side for you. Do what? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, but my question is, so I've got two different toasted single barrels here. They're both heavy char, uh, or heavy toast, I'm sorry. One is a char three, and the other is a char one. So do y'all just take what you can get in terms of char and toast levels, uh, or do you get a little bit of everything? Is, a, is it a roll of the dice? How, how does that work? So we, we flex it. Uh, depending, there's a couple of different things that kind of go into that. One is the, the type of bourbon that we're getting. We've, we're starting to learn over the years of what goes well with what char and toast. Um, also, time of year plays a, a really important part with those char and toast levels. Um, and also timing. Like the lower chars are usually a, a much longer finish. But you get a lot more of that like caramel and, and kind of marshmallow note. The higher chars are a shorter finish. Um, they usually work better in winter um, just because they're a shorter finish and they, they don't really need the heat to kind of extract yeah. like the low charts do. Um, so like things like that really play into what char and toast levels we, we pick. So as we go along the year and we're ordering our new oak barrels, we'll just kind of tweak the, tweak the order depending on how many we need for that time of year. Yeah, and I, I think what we found fun about Toasted Series was that it's cool that they're all different char and toast levels because uh, they're all so different. I mean, we work with Kelvin, Speyside, uh, and McGinnis out of, out of Missouri, and they're all so dramatically different, and I think that's what we found fun about this particular product. So uh, with the finishing process on the Toasted, especially the barrels we have going in New Jersey, um, it's, it's a fun process. So we will pull samples once a week and taste through and see where they're at because they change so rapidly. Um, some barrels, you know, they'll taste like, to, to be honest, they'll taste like crap for like two months, like something went haywire <laughs> in the experiment. And then all of a sudden you'll get like a change of like pressure in the air or a system comes through or, uh, it's you get a it. warm spell and the, then they're awesome the next week. So like little things like that kind of change them. We can also kind of flex how they work too. If we maybe are storing some of them outside and you're tasting it and nothing's really happening and you're not really getting to where you need it to be, then we'll be like, you yeah, know, why don't we bring them inside for, for a little, for a week or two. And then, you know, you can kind of change the finishing process that way. And this is all stuff we're just, we've been learning since we started doing this product. Cool. Great info. Alex, hey, good question. Alex thank you. Go home. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Yes. So in New Jersey, where do you store your warehouse? And how many do you Anywhere. Anywhere yeah. where we can find space. Legally. We had uh, we had uh, we had a very famous warehouse C actually in New Jersey. It was a shipping container. And then we had to break it down, unfortunately. Yeah, we had a state didn't like that. <laughs> Got rid we had to get rid of warehouse. We literally had to get rid of warehouse C. How many we got there? Uh, we have like 200 in New Jersey. Just right in New now. Jersey. New Jersey's like, they're constantly coming in. Yeah. Uh, but we have quite a few with MGP right. now. And then we have. No. No. Not on purpose. Old, old school. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, awesome. Okay, you all ready for drawing? All right. Hey, you got a question? You want a question? One more question? Oh, okay. All right, let's do a little Civil War trivia. <laughs> Who was the president of the Confederate? Never mind. Okay, we're going to do a drawing. All right, this is for the bottle. 
And let me tell you, Andrea, I've got something for you after this. But I opened my Rio today, and it is really, really damn good. It really is. So, Danny, you want to draw? Yeah. All right, here's the winner of the bottle of Rio. Is it me? <laughs> Danny, don't screw it up. All right. Must be present to win. Two five nine zero eight nine. Dennis Fouché. <laughs> Dennis, we're going to have these gentlemen sign it for you, and we'll get a picture. Did anybody look at the number? Did anybody double check the next graduate? They're kind of sneaky over there, that Catholic school. We got school. a winner. <laughs> hey. Good job. Thank you. All right. So hold on. May I would you take a picture of it? Absolutely. Here. Thank you. All right. Let's hear. Hey, Dennis. Scoot way over there to get the little. Okay. Okay. Everybody disappointed equally. All right. So let me do this. Let's, uh, we've had a full night. Let's call it quits. But before we go, uh, hey, hey, guys. Hey, before we go, Danny and Mike flew in from New Jersey this morning to be here for this event. Please give them a warm round of applause. Thank you all so much. Thanks, man. Thanks, Danny. What I, what I wanted to say earlier, uh, and I forgot, I lost my train of thought, but when uh, Mike found me on TikTok, every time I've texted this guy, he acts like I'm his best friend. He's never met me in his life until today. Honest to God, you're friendly, you're responsive. You two deserve it more than anybody. So congratulations with what's happened to your success. Uh, a, couple, a couple of other folks, let me introduce, uh, raise your hand if you've been to, raise your hand if you've been to Coppers and King in Louisville. Okay, Drew Pomeroy, stand up. So Drew is with Coppers and King. I had never been there till last week, uh, and I was invited down, and these guys are incredible. I didn't know what brandy was, I didn't know, I didn't know how to spell it. It turns out that Drew's from Georgia, and he married our babysitter's sister, so we're, like, related. <laughs> but they've got, they've, they've got, number one, I had several brandies. I'm like, shit, all I need is another vice. But it's <laughs> really, really good, and it's so much more like bourbon than it is a sweet port or something like that. But they have 250 barrels of whiskey, of bourbon, in the basement, in the cellar, that they're finishing in apple and you're only finishing it in the apple brandy barrels. And they took me around to 32 very little cups and it was like, oh my God, it is so good. But I've never been on their campus. If you've not been to Coppers and King, it'll blow your mind how cool it is. It is beautiful. It is well done. And there's a lot of money invested in it. Go support your local coppers of King. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, also, Matt Byer, Matt and I went to high school together. He, it, the rumor is he sat behind me and looked over my shoulder on test day. I think it's a bad rumor because, but anyway, Matt runs RNDC here in Louisville. So not only is he a player in the industry, he is a great guy. And we reconnected recently with Garrison Brothers, who will be here on June 17th. And lastly, after about... 10 bourbons on Millionaire's Row. I'm at Graham and Sam. Stand up. Graham and Sam, father, daughter, and Suzanne and I were talking, and we really liked them, so we invited them out tonight. And uh, Graham struggled through Notre Dame Law School, but we think she'll be successful. So thanks for coming out tonight. All right, everybody, listen. Your waitresses worked really, really hard tonight. Tip them handsomely. Thank everybody here. Chris, thank you. Great job, everybody.